I'm Major Garrett in Washington, and this week on Face the Nation, the third indictment of Donald Trump. Many believe this could be the most serious case yet. Listen to the words of Special Prosecutor Jack Smith. The attack on our nation's capital on January 6th, 2021, was an unprecedented assault on the seat of American democracy. It was fueled by lies. Lies by the defendant targeted at obstructing a bedrock function of the U.S. government, the nation's process of collecting, counting, and certifying the results of the presidential election. I must emphasize that the indictment is only an allegation and that the defendant must be presumed innocent until proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. We will talk with three Trump administration figures who could testify, Vice President Mike Pence and two officials who also told Trump there was no evidence of widespread fraud in the 2020 election. Attorney General Bill Barr and the head of the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, now a CBS News expert and analyst, Chris Krebs. Trump attorney John Lauro will also be with us. Plus, what do Americans think? Every time they file an indictment, we go way up in the polls. We need one more indictment to close out this election. Will Trump's theory hold? Former Congressman and GOP hopeful Will Hurd will join us. Plus, Minnesota Democrat Dean Phillips says his party should look for an alternative to President Biden. We'll talk to him about that. It's all just ahead on Face the Nation. Welcome to Face the Nation. Margaret is off today. As we come on the air this morning, disappointing news from Australia as the U.S. women's soccer team has lost its knockout round match to Sweden and has therefore been eliminated in the World Cup. Here in the U.S., the impact of former President Trump's third criminal indictment has not only underscored divisions in our country between the parties, but it appears that Republicans are also divided as well, with some Trump supporters still believing he did nothing wrong, others not so sure. And in that light, we begin today with former Vice President Mike Pence, a man once seen as extremely loyal to Trump, that is, until they lost the 2020 election. At which point, Pence says, Trump pressured him to try to overturn the election and in their favor. We spoke with Pence in New Hampshire yesterday. President Trump was wrong. Uh, uh, he was wrong then, he's wrong now. I had no right to overturn uh, the election. And uh, uh, more and more Americans are coming up to me every day and recognizing that. And, and uh, for my part, uh, I'm running for president in part because, uh, frankly, President Trump asked me to put him over the Constitution that day. But I chose the Constitution, and uh, I always will. So I want to ask you about characterizations that have been made by those who speak on behalf of the president's legal team. They've said this week that all they asked of you, that is to say the president, was to delay the proceedings to allow states to conduct an audit. Is that a truthful representation of what you were asked to do, Mr. Vice President? Major, that's not what happened. From some time in the middle of December, uh, the president began to uh, be told that I had some authority to reject or return votes back to the states. I had no such authority. I stand by the facts as they occurred. I mean, it, it ebbed and flowed between uh, different legal theories. But at the end of the day, I, I know we did our duty. I know we kept our oath. But I, I, I truly do believe that, uh, uh, you know, no one who ever puts himself over the Constitution should ever be president of the United States. Mr. Vice President, if this case comes to trial, would you be a witness against the president? People can be confident. We'll, uh, we'll obey the law. We'll respond to the call. Uh, of the law if it comes, and, and we'll just tell the truth. Look, I, I've been telling this story over the last two years, but I, I must tell you over the last week, it, it seems that more and more Americans have been coming up to me and just expressing a word of appreciation for what, by God's grace, that we did that day. To be clear, Mr. Vice President, you do not regard this indictment as the political persecution of the former president. Well, I've been very concerned about politicization at the Justice Department for years. I've been deeply troubled uh, to see the double standard between, uh, uh, you know, the, the way that the Justice Department has gone after the president, and responded even in, with other Republicans and pro-life Americans, and the way they seem to be, to take no interest in getting to the bottom of allegations of corruption around 
President Biden's family. So I, I have deep concern about that. But look, I, I don't want to prejudge this indictment. I don't know whether the uh, government uh, has the evidence beyond a reasonable doubt uh, to support this case. The president's entitled uh, to the presumption of innocence. Mr. Vice President, tell me about these notes that the special prosecutor referred to in the indictment. Were those all the notes you took on all of your conversations with the former president at that time? Were you a note taker throughout your time as vice president? Did you hand them off to staff? Were these things you kept yourself? Tell me about the note, the, the note process. Well, I, I can tell you, Major, I have some limitations of what I can talk about relative to the grand jury. But uh, there was from time to time, particularly at important moments, uh, I had a practice of scribbling a note or two on my calendar just to memorialize it and remember it. And I did that in this case. I generally didn't make a practice of taking notes in meetings over the four-year period of time. But given the momentous events that were unfolding, I, I, I did take a few notes to remind myself of what had been said. And, you know, from very early on, the very first time the president raised the issue with me that I, that he was being told that I had the right to overturn the election, to reject the return votes, I, I, I told him I knew I had no such authority. Look, I'm, I'm a student of American history. I knew the founders of this country would never have given any one person the right to choose what electoral college votes to accept and which ones uh, to reject. Uh, I was very consistent with the president about that, uh, and my recollections all reflect that. But, uh, you know, at, at the end of the day, uh, uh, the president continued to, to hold to that view, uh, but I knew what my duty was. Uh, and as I said, by God's grace, we did our duty on that fateful day. Mr. Vice President, what do you believe the president's state of mind was about whether he won or lost the 2020 election? You know, I really can't say. I, I, I don't know what was in his mind. And uh, it seemed to me through all that period of time, the, you know, the president was intent, as we all were, in getting to the bottom of voting irregularities that had taken place. There were roughly a half a dozen states that had changed the rules in the name of COVID and frankly change them in ways that could benefit Democrat candidates. But in more than 60 lawsuits, all of which I supported and in reviews at state levels, there, there was never any evidence of widespread fraud that would have changed the outcome of the election in any of those states. Did you ever hear the president say, I lost? Or did you ever take part in a meeting where it was clear from other words that he spoke that he knew he had lost and was preparing to leave the White House? I remember one occasion before Christmas where the president asked me what, what, what he thought we ought to do. We were just the two of us in the Oval Office, Major, and I, I remember I looked at him and I said, look, let all the lawsuits play out. Uh, let the uh, Congress do their work to consider objections. But I said, at the end of the day, uh, if the election goes the other way, I said, we ought to take a bow. We ought to travel around the country. And I remember, remember the president is standing in front of his desk listening very intently to me. And, I'll never forget the way he just kind of pointed at me as if to, as if to say, that's worth thinking about. But I don't know what was in his mind at the time. Would you ever vote again for Donald Trump? Look, I don't think I'll have to. I, I have to tell you, everywhere that, I go. That wasn't the question, Mr. Uh, Vice President. We Would you ever vote for Donald Trump again? Yeah. yeah, yeah, I know what your question is, but let me be very clear. I'm running for president. Uh, because uh, I don't think anyone who ever puts himself over the Constitution should ever be president or should ever be president again. Uh, I, look, this country's in a lot of trouble. Uh, and we've got to get back to basics. We've got to get back to keeping faith with the Constitution. We've got to get back to the policies that'll make our economy strong, that'll secure our border, that'll support our military, that'll defend our liberties and our values that are under a steady assault by the Biden administration. And uh, uh, we're gonna work our hearts out to earn the right to be that standard bearer. One last thing, do you believe the former president can receive a fair trial in the District of Columbia? Well, I, I, I would hope so, but I, I don't want to prejudge uh, the indictment or prejudge whether, uh, whether the government can make their case. Uh, look, the president's entitled to a presumption of innocence, and uh, I, I have every confidence that, uh, that he'll make his case in court, but at the end of the day, uh, at the end of the day, I'm going to stay focused on where the American people are focused. But I, I'm also, I'm never going to waver in making it clear to people that, that whatever the outcome of uh, this indictment and whatever it's, you know, wherever it goes, um, I know I did my duty that day. Former Vice President Mike Pence, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Major.
<clears throat> we turn now to Bill Barr, who served as former president's attorney general until he resigned following the 2020 election. Bill, it's good to see you. Good to see you. Guys. Last time you were on the show, you said, quote, the January 6th case will be a hard case to make because of First Amendment interest, unquote. Having read the indictment, is that still your view? Well, it's it's certainly a challenging case, but I don't I don't think it runs afoul of the First Amendment. And there's a lot of confusion about this out there. Maybe I can crystallize it. This involved uh, a situation where the states had already made the official and authoritative determination as to who won in those states, and they sent the votes and certified them to Congress. The allegation, essentially, by the government is that at that point, the president conspired entered into a, a plan, a scheme that involved a lot of deceit, the object of which was to erase those votes, to nullify those lawful votes. To disenfranchise people. Right. And there were a number of things that were alleged. One of them is that they tried to bully the state authorities to withdraw their certification by citing instances of fraud. And what the, uh, and, and what the indictment says is, the stuff that they were spouting, they knew was wrong and false. This is not a question of what his subjective idea was as to whether he won or lost. They're saying what you were saying consistently, the stuff you were spouting, you knew was wrong. But it's not. if that was all it was about, I would be concerned on the First Amendment front. But they go beyond that. And the other elements were the substitution of bogus panels that were not uh, authorized panels to claim that they had alternative votes, and then they cut, and, and and that was clearly wrong, and 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 the, and the certifications they signed were false. But then pressuring the vice president to use that as a pretext to adopt the Trump votes and reject the Biden votes, or even to delay it. It really doesn't matter whether it's to delay it or to adopt it or to send it to the House of Representatives. You have to remember. A conspiracy crime is completed at the time it's agreed to and the first steps are taken. That's it? That's when the crime is complete. From a prosecutor's point of view, is this a case you would have brought? Well, from a prosecutor's standpoint, I think it's a legitimate case. But From an attorney general's point of view. But I think there are other considerations, and I would have taken those into account. But I've also said consistently, really, the Rubicon was passed here when, when Attorney General Garland picked Smith. Because the kinds of decisions, uh, the kinds of judgments that would say don't bring the case or really have to be made by the attorney general. And he, he picked uh, a prosecutor. And I think at that point, the decision was, if there's a case, we're going to bring it. That's when the Rubicon was passed. Were you interviewed was. by the special counsel? I'm not going to get into any discussion. Would you like appear that. as a witness if called? Of course. Could you describe your interactions with the president on this question about whether or not he won or lost and what you told him? Uh, well, I wasn't uh, discussing. Well, I go through that in my book in painstaking detail, but uh, on three occasions at least, and uh, I, I told him in no uh, uncertain terms that there was no evidence of fraud that would have changed the outcome. One of those associated with the Trump defense team has said, if you were called as a witness, they would cross-examine you and pierce all of that by asking you questions that you couldn't, to their mind credibly answer about how thorough that investigation was that led you to tell the president what you told him. How thorough was that investigation? Well, it, I think it, it satisfied us that there was no basis uh, for uh, concluding that there had been fraud in those instances. Some of them were obvious, okay? Uh, one that he keeps on repeating is, you know, that there were more, uh, that more uh, people voted than absentee ballots that were requested. And that was mixing apples and oranges. And once that was explained to him, uh, we should we should have heard no more about that. Others required further investigation, interviews, and so forth, and those were done. I want to get your thoughts on Hunter Biden. On December 21st, your last day, or nearly your last day in 2020 in the role of attorney general, you said, I think it's being handled responsibly and professionally currently with the department. This is the Hunter Biden investigation. And to this point, I have seen no reason to appoint a special counsel. Do you believe a special counsel should be appointed now on the Hunter Biden matter, and do you regret not appointing one then? No, because the, the... No which to which? Should one be appointed now? No. When I was the attorney, in order to appoint a special counsel, you have to have a conflict or should have a conflict of interest. I had no conflict of interest investigating Hunter Biden. If there was a conflict, it would be Garland's, and he had to make the decision 
when he took office as to whether or not it could be fairly handled in the department or whether or not a special counsel is necessary. I felt that if I prejudged that and preempted his decision, it would actually set things up that he would have probably, or the administration would have just canceled the uh, investigation. And I felt he would keep uh, our U.S. attorney in place. But once Garland came in, he had the responsibility of determining whether a thorough investigation was being done and was being done fairly. Do you believe a thorough investigation has, an, yeah, I, has I did, been conducted? Well, I did agree with the, the uh, House Republicans that uh, there was a time where he should have appointed a special counsel. Is that time passed? Well, practically it may have passed because there's not very much time to get to the bottom of things unless Weiss has been doing it conscientiously. And we have to hear from Weiss as to what he's the done. The U.S. attorney in yes. Delaware. Yes. Do you believe, as you said earlier, that there was a lot of shameful self-dealing and influence peddling in regards to Hunter Biden? And if so, do you believe those are criminally prosecutable actions? Okay, well, one thing I stress is those are two different questions, right? And, uh, you know, things can be shameful without being illegal. And I, I yes, I thought they, I, I think it's grotesque, the, the cashing in on the office like that, uh, uh, apparently. But, uh, I think it's legitimate. It has to be investigated as to whether there was a crime there. And that's one of the things I'm concerned about, is that it was thoroughly investigated after I left. You're concerned still whether or not it was thoroughly investigated? I don't know. I, I, I would like to hear about it. I mean, some of the whistleblowers raise concerns in my mind. There's reasons. For, before the election, there were reasons to defer certain investigative steps under Justice Department policy. But after the election, I don't see reasons for deferring investigative steps. And apparently someone said it was the optics. Well, what are the optics, you know, after the election? That it was the president-elect's son? That's not a reason not to investigate. William Barr, we thank you for your time yeah. very, very much. Face the Nation will be back in just one moment. Please stay with us. We go now to New York and CBS News Elections and Surveys Director Anthony Salvanta, who has some new reaction to the former president's indictment. Anthony, what can you tell us? Good morning, Major. In the polling this week, we learned that Americans' response to this week is about more than what they think of Donald Trump's actions, but also what they think it means for democracy. First, half the country believes that after 2020, what the nation witnessed was a then-sitting president trying to remain in office through what they feel were illegal and unconstitutional means. Now, they say if true, that would be undermining democracy. And for them, these indictments then mean it's upholding the rule of law and protecting that democracy. But there's another three in 10, 29%, who feel that Donald Trump did try to stay in office, but through legal means. And what's telling here is that most of them, like most Republicans, continue to believe Donald Trump's disproven claims about a fraudulent election. Now, there's another echo of Donald Trump's campaign rhetoric in here, and that is this personal connection. Most Republicans, especially most MAGA Republicans, also see these indictments as an attack on people like them. And they also see it as politically motivated. That is their overriding concern, more so than any of the content of the charges. They think very specifically here that this is an attempt to stop Donald Trump's 2024 campaign. Major? With the survey data and the perspective, Anthony Salvanto, thank you. And we'll be right back. Welcome back. For the most part, Republican candidates challenging the former president for the Republican Party nomination are treading carefully in their reaction to this latest indictment. Fearing that they've not, they're going to alienate the president's sizable base of support. That's not so with former Texas Congressman Will Hurd, who joins us this morning. Congressman, good to see you. So you were in Des Moines and you said to Republicans there that the only reason that the former president is running is to, quote, stay out of prison. It was believed that you were booed off that stage. A couple of Republicans texted me in real time that they thought you looked weak. Looking back on that, do you wish you had done that differently or said things differently or acted differently? Uh, absolutely not. What, what people are missing was that a number of people actually clapped uh, when I said that and it was the end of the speech. Uh, so I casually walked off and I, and I stick behind it. And this is one of the things that makes me unique in this race. I've been ideologically consistent about Donald Trump since 2015. I've thought he's been a national security threat to the country and was incapable of, of growing our brand. Uh, I'm the only one that has never bent a knee uh, to Donald Trump and, and that's not gonna change because 
we, if we want to win elections, we got to be talking about how do we have unprecedented peace at a time when the Chinese government is trying to surpass us as the global superpower? How do we have world-class education at a time when our kids are failing in math, science, and reading, some of the worst scores in this century? These are the issues that we're talking about, not talking about Donald Trump's baggage. And if people agree with that, I need them to go on HerdForAmerica.com and give at least one dollar to what help me get on the debate you, stage. What does it tell you, Will Hurd, when you see the president's polling, your polling, the vast distance between the two, and the sentiment expressed by Republicans over and over and over again that they're with Trump and not with people like you who criticize him so harshly. Sure, the, the election's 25 weeks away. A lot can change, and anybody who thinks that these are overwhelming uh, odds, I would tell them I disagree with them. Nobody thought a black Republican could win in a 72% Latino district on 820 miles of the board, but it happened because I showed up to places that people didn't expect me to be. A national polls, running for president is not, is not a national election. It's 50 elections, and this is gonna always tighten, and the goal True enough, is- but you can't cite a single state poll where you're even in double digits. Well, because the election's not today, or it's not tomorrow. The election is 25 weeks away. In order to build a campaign and talk to the people that are sick and tired of where the country is, go is going, it takes time. Two-thirds of Americans do not want Donald Trump or Joe Biden on, on the ballot. Like, that is clear, and that has always been the case. And we also know if Donald Trump is the nominee for the Republican Party, we're giving four more years to Joe Biden. So let me be clear, Major, mm -hmm. the, the goal is not to peak tomorrow. Mm. Uh, the goal is to peak before the first, the first All right, election. Let's talk about something that's not 25 weeks away. But much sooner, the first Republican debate. Will you qualify for that debate stage? And if so, how? Uh, I haven't hit the I haven't hit the number yet, but I feel 40, confident. Forty thousand unique yeah, donors. I, I feel confident that we're going to get to that place. How close and are you? I'm 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 close. Define and, and close. I'm not going to get. I'm not. I don't Within get 10, into 000? details. <laughs> I'm close, and that's why I need the people that are watching this show to go on HerdForAmerica.com. Donate at least one dollar to make sure that they have someone who's ideologically consistent meet the requirements to be on the debate stage. Why are you still a Republican? I'm still a Republican because I believe in a, a, a strong foreign policy. I believe in freedom. I believe in actual personal responsibility. That's not always reflected in many of the people that are in the party, but here's where it is reflected. Is it reflective of what Donald Trump does? No, not at all. Uh, but there's more people that identify with so Donald Trump with the is not a good Republican. I don't think he's a good Republican at all. Um, you know, Donald Trump is 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 Donald Trump, and 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 I believe in these these the timeless principles of the party because I think that leads to limitless potential. And when you look at when I think about the party, most people say, "Is it the former president? Is it our elected officials?" You know, I believe it's the people that are willing to vote for a Republican. And here's what I've learned crisscrossing this country: there are more people that are sick and tired of the direction the Democratic Party is is going, and what they want. Is someone who's not a jerk, who's not a racist, who's not a misogynist, who's not someone who's a homophobe. You know, this is the opportunity the Republican Party has, and that's Very the brand. Quickly, the that four I'm words you just used, do all of them apply to former President Trump? At, at times, absolutely. And at times, other places and other candidates that are in this race. Guess what? Slavery, there's no upside to slavery. We shouldn't have to be having that conversation this, in, in 2023. Will Hurd, Republican candidate for the presidency in 2024. Thanks for being with us. Thank you. And we'll be back in just one moment. We will be right back with a lot more Face the Nation. Up next, Trump attorney John Lauro. Please stay with us. We go now to John Lauro, one of former President Trump's lawyers. He joins us now from New York. John, good morning to you. I want to let you know that we spoke with former good Vice morning. President Mike Pence and asked him specifically about your assertions made this last week that all the president did was asked him to pause the certification on January 6, 2021. He told me flatly, quote, that's not what happened. Your response. That's not that's not what I said, though, but that's OK. What what is it that you believe happened between the president I, and the vice president? And do you have any I, fear of I, the vice president being what, called as a witness in the case? No, no. In fact, the vice president will be our best witness. What I said is the ultimate ask of Vice President Pence was to pause the count and allow the states to weigh in. That was my statement. And what what I've said is consistent with what 
Vice President Pence is saying. The reason why Vice President Pence will be so important to the defense is, is the following. Number one, he agrees that John Eastman, who gave legal advice to President Trump, was an esteemed legal scholar. Number two, he agrees that there were election irregularities, fraud, unlawful actions at the state level. All of that will, will eviscerate any allegation of criminal intent on the part of President Trump. And finally, what Vice President Pence believes and believed is that these issues needed to be deba debated on January 6th. He openly called for all of these issues to be debated and objected to uh, in, in the January 6th proceeding. President Trump, on the other hand, believed, uh, following the advice of John Eastman, who's a legal scholar, that these issues needed to be debated at the state level, not the federal level. Now, of course, there was a constitutional disagreement between Vice President Pence and President Trump. But the bottom line is never, never in our country's history has those kinds of disagreements been uh, prosecuted criminally. It's, it's unheard of. John, can I ask you a couple of very simple, basic yes or no questions? Is there, first, is there any condition under which the former President of the United States, your client, would accept a plea deal on these January 6th charges? No. Will you seek a motion to dismiss? Absolutely, 100%. When? 100%. Uh, well, within the time permitted, this is what's called a Swiss cheese indictment. It has so many holes that we're going to be um, uh, identifying and litigating uh, a number of, of motions that we're going to file on First Amendment grounds on the fact that President Trump is immune as president from, from being prosecuted in this way. Do you, have a, do you have a ballpark figure of when you'd be ready for trial? I, well, I can tell you that in 40 years of practicing law, on a case of this magnitude, I've not known a single case to go to trial be before two or three years. Understood. Are you still going to pursue a change of venue? Absolutely. We, we would like a diverse venue, a diverse jury. Um, Do you have any that, expectation uh, that, that will be granted? The, that reflects the, 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 the characteristics of the American people. Um, it's up to the judge. I think West Virginia would be an excellent venue to try this case. Speaking Very of the close judge. To DC in a much more diverse. Understood. Speaking of the judge, earlier this week, your client, the former president, said on his social media platform, the judge is unfair. On what basis did he say that? Well, the problem with bringing a case like this in the middle of a campaign season is statements are going to be made in the context of a campaign. We expect a fair and just trial in the District of Columbia. Um, and, and my role, my role is simply to ensure that President Trump's rights, just like every American's rights, are protected every step of the way, and I'm going to do that. You mentioned a discovery. In the protective order back and forth between you and the prosecutors, it says, the prosecution, that discovery will be provided, quote, as soon as possible including certain discovery to which the defendant is not entitled. What's wrong with that? We're, we're all in favor of protecting uh, sensitive and highly sensitive information, but it's unprecedented to have all information um, hidden uh, in a criminal case, including, by the way, information that might be exculpatory and, and might be exonerative of President Trump. Um, the Biden administration wants to keep that information from the American people. John, in the back and forth on this matter, you also said in the filing to the court that the former president would be willing to come to an agreement on this matter. And what I want to ask you is, would that requirement be something where the president would agree not to release any information that was highly sensitive in this matter? And would he also refrain from any speech that called for or hinted at retribution about anyone associated with the prosecution of this case? He's never called for that at all. Um, he's going to abide by the conditions of his release. Um, but of course, we would agree that any sensitive or highly sensitive information um, be kept under wraps. In fact, we made that proposition to the Biden administration, um, but they rejected it. They want every single piece of evidence in this case hidden from the American public. John, before I let you go, do you remember what you were doing the early morning of November 9th, 2016? I have no idea. Well, I remember what I was doing. I was covering President-elect Trump announcing that he had won the presidency about 3 a.m. that morning after the November 8th election. My question to you, John, is how did he know he won? 
Well, politicians um, are convinced in the righteousness of their cause, including President Trump, and he certainly believed that he won. But on won, what basis did he know he, he won? But on what basis did he know he won? Can I finish? Can yeah. I finish? Sure. Can I finish? And he believed in 2020 that he won based on the fact that he had 10 million more votes than in 2016. He had uh, a situation where somehow President Biden, or at that time, candidate Biden, received 15 million more votes than Hillary Clinton. And he also understood in 2020 that President, that President Trump understood that he had won all, virtually all of the bellwether counties right. and 84 percent of all the counties in the country. John, let me, so on let that me, basis, let me he help you with this. that he was successful. John, let me help you with this. I wasn't asking about 2020. No, let me help you with this because I wasn't the asking about here, 2020, I to John. This because, John, I wasn't asking no, about no, no, 2020. No, no. The, the I was issue, asking about 2016. Right. Because the, issue, because the votes right, were still being in counted in 2016. Case. The votes were still right. being counted in 2016. Right. There'd been no recounts. How did he right. know in 2016 right. that he had won? How did he know? On what well, basis? The, 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 issue, the issue, let me just tell you something. The issue in this criminal case is not what happened in 2016 and whether all candidates say they won. The issue now is in 2020, whether or not the Justice Department can weaponize criminal law to go after a political opponent and prevent that opponent from running for office. That's the issue, not what happened in 2016. John Lauro, we thank you, you for your think time. It's fair? Do you think it's fair that, do you think it's fair what the, what the Biden administration is doing to a candidate for president? Uh, John Lauro, we thank you for your time. We appreciate it. Thank you. And we will be right back. Welcome back. We turn now to Minnesota Democratic Congressman Dean Phillips, who might, in fact, be able to answer a question he's given some energy to. Are you going to run for president against Joe Biden? Well, Major, I have not decided yet, but I will tell you why I'm here. And I lost my dad in Vietnam in 1969, uh, lived with my great grandparents for two and a half years. Uh, my mom was 24 and widowed. Uh, was adopted when I was three by an extraordinary dad into a remarkable family. I know a little something about living on both sides of advantage. And I woke up the morning after the 2016 election, the one you just spoke about, saw fear in my daughter's eyes, my two daughters. I recognized at that moment that millions of Americans have had that same fear for generations. And I promised them I would do something. I ran for Congress. And I ran a campaign that was about everybody being invited. That was my slogan. I listened to Democrats, Republicans, mm -hmm. Independents, and I discovered that everybody wants the same thing, everybody. We want to be safe, we want to have security, both economic and otherwise. We want opportunity and we want unity. Serving our country in Congress has been a joy. I know you don't hear that too often, it has mm -hmm. been a joy. And I've discovered that everybody in the middle, the massive majority of Americans mm -hmm. are sick of angertainment, telling us we're more divided than we really are. They're sick of members of Congress, state houses, attacking each other instead of attacking problems. They want their families back, their friendships back, their communities back, they want unity. And I want to give voice to them. Yep. And then secondly, mm -hmm. I want to give voice to Democrats. I'm a lifelong, passionate Democrat, uh, inspired by Hubert Humphrey and Martin Luther King. Uh, Democrats are telling me that they want not a coronation, but they want a competition. The New York Times poll from this week shows 55% of Democratic voters want some alternatives to the current people in the primary. 83% of those under 30, Democrats under 30, want alternatives, and about 76% of independents. So when I just want to make my decide? case. When are you going to decide? I think, well, let me get to my point. Okay. So if we don't heed... I've given you some room. <laughs> yes, you have. If we don't heed that call, shame on us. And the consequences, I believe, are going to be disastrous. So my call is to those who are well-positioned, well-prepared, of good character and competency, they know who they are, to jump in, because Democrats and the country need competition. It makes everything better. That's my call to them right now. So if they don't, you will? I'm not saying I will. I, look, I think I'm well-positioned to be president of the United States. You do? I do not believe I'm well-positioned to run for it right now. People who are mm -hmm. should jump in, because we need to meet the moment. The moment is now that is what the country is asking. I gave you some running room, so let's tighten up the answers if we can. Can sure. President Biden beat Donald Trump? I think he can, but I think the only way to determine that objectively is to go through a process. By the way, before it's too late, and I want to tell you this about President Biden, an amazing man. Mm -hmm. I love the man. He is competent. He is honorable. His integrity, I believe, is unvarnished. 
He has led this country through extraordinarily difficult times. This is not about him. This is about listening to people. And I'm afraid in this bubble here in Washington, people get real tone deaf real fast, and we should be listening. That's what this is about. It's my call to action. Assess Robert F. Kennedy Jr.'s campaign. Well, first of all, I, th I like competition. I'm pleased that people... Is he an adequate competitor? Not the one that I'm looking for. I don't believe him to be a Democrat. Is I there think some of the things, telling? Let me say this. In what's I happened care, around him? I think there is something telling. I think he's using a very similar playbook to a former president who did the same in the Republican Party just a little while ago. And I think we should be cautious of that. I also think that's why we need alternatives. I don't believe him to be a Democrat. Are you I do believe, though, that speech is good. More speech is even better. We need alternatives for the massive majority of the middle in America I make sure to have some alternatives, too. Correctly, you don't believe Robert F. Kennedy Jr. is a Democrat? I, not, not from the positions he's been taking, no. Assess Cornell West. Do you have any anxiety about him running as a uh, Green Party candidate? I do. Anybody who wants to turn the page and go to the future in this country should be worried about Cornell, Cornell West's candidacy. Uh, any third party entrance that would take votes from whoever is going to take on the likely nominee from the GOP, and that's probably Donald Trump. So I would ask Mr. West, I would ask others who are contemplating third party runs to please think about your legacy, think about the future, and consolidate around entering a Democratic primary, because that's why we have primaries. I'm confused, Congressman. If there's a conversation that you say needs to occur within the Democratic Party about an alternative to the sitting president of the United States, why isn't the leading contender for that the sitting vice president of the United States, Kamala Harris? I think we have a, I think we live in an era of fear. What if I get out of line? What if I take on my party? I is know she, the feeling this is week. She I not, think, is she not qualified? I think she's absolutely qualified. In fact, I think she's misportrayed. I think everybody in this country should take a little bit of time and sit with people, observe them, know them before you draw conclusions. I think she is more competent and able than many people give her credit for. The job of the vice president is not an easy one. Would she, in your mind, be the heir apparent if, for some reason, the president of the United States were not to seek the nomination in 2024? I'm glad you asked the question, and my answer is really simple. Competition. As many people as humanly possible with the talent, the time, the energy, the ethics to enter a primary should do it. We have 12 Republicans as options for Republican primary voters. Right now, we only have three in the Democratic side. I believe in competition. We're the Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. Democracy means the freedom to make choices and we don't have many of them. Let me ask you a historical question. You've invoked the names of many Minnesota Democrats. Let me invoke the name of another. Eugene McCarthy ran in 1968 against a well-positioned president with a substantial record of accomplishment for Democratic Party agenda items. He said the reason he had to run was because of the overwhelming issue of Vietnam, mm -hmm. that it had to be addressed. Dean Phillips, what's the Vietnam of this election? The Vietnam of this election, I think everybody knows, and it's about turning the page to the future. That is the Vietnam of right now. That's the quagmire in which we find ourselves. Mr. Hurd, who you just had on the show, if you could see the green room moments ago, the camaraderie between Democrats and Republicans who all want the same thing was represented right there. And I want to remind the American people, that's the Vietnam of right now. The quagmire in which we find ourselves, we will not get out of from a single leader. If everybody takes a pause, starts reaching out their hands to one another again, starts electing and selecting people of competency and good character, we're going to get out of this, and I'm optimistic. Dean Phillips, Congressman from Minnesota, Democrat. Keep in touch. Thank you, Major. We'll be back in just a moment. Welcome back. Up now, CBS News cybersecurity expert and analyst Chris Krebs, who as head of CISA, we'll get into what that means in a second, announced soon after the 2020 election that it was the, quote, most secure election in history. The former president disagreed and memorably, to Chris, fired him. Chris, it's good to see you. Good to see you, Major. What was the basis of that statement, well, that it was the most secure election in American history? So let's uh, contextualize that statement a little Please. bit. It was issued uh, on November 12th by a group known as the Election uh, Subsector uh, Joint Coordinating Council. So this was leaders from the federal government, state government, and local government, election of involved in the administration of elections, alongside those from uh, from the private sector and those that, that support. Across the country. Yes. So this was not my statement. This was not CISA's statement. This is not a red or blue statement. Correct. This was a bipartisan joint statement by those that are actually involved in the day-to-day -day administration of elections. And it was their real-time, in-the-moment perspective of what was happening around the United States election at that point. And, and the important part is that it wasn't just about November 3rd and what immediately preceded and what immediately followed. It was a collective effort 
really spanning back from my perspective, back to 2017, that joint effort that we had worked to develop strong partnerships around election security within the federal government, but also with state and local elections. And as I understand it, President Trump encouraged you to do that very work, did he not? That we had the full support of the White House, the National Security Council, and those that were immediately within uh, the orbit of the president. In fact, I, I briefed uh, uh, the, the vice president, uh, who was on earlier, several times on our election security. Effort. What is CISA? CISA is the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency. It was established by President Trump in 2018, and it is, as Jen Easterly, the, the current director, calls it, uh, the nation's civilian cyber defense agency. And at any time when you were briefing either the vice president or the president or senior administration officials about the work you were doing and what it was leading up to in the 2020 election, did they raise any concerns about your ability, your acuity, your trustworthiness, or the trustworthiness of the data you were getting back to you? We had full support from not just the White House and the executive branch, uh, but also from Congress. We, we briefed Congress. I personally briefed Will Hurt several times, briefed uh, a range of senators and members of the House of Representatives throughout 2020 on our efforts to secure the 2020 election and received, as I said, full-throated support. And when you say security, what does that mean? Does that mean no penetration and that's it? Or does it mean other things under the umbrella of security and secure elections? Well, our efforts starting in 2017 were to work with and establish relationships where we could share information and provide cybersecurity services to state and local election officials so that they could harden their systems and increase the resilience of those systems. And, and, and the key takeaway, as I see it, for the 2020 election is that it was effectively the most audited and most papered election uh, in, in recent history. Why is that important? Well, uh, your, your colleague, David Becker, your co-author, uh, runs the Center for Election uh, and Innovation Research. And he conducted a study that uh, says that in 2016, less than 80% of uh, ballots cast had a paper record associated with it. Paper records are important because you can audit the results. If there are any questions, you can go back, check your math, and ensure the, the uh, counting was accurate. By the time the 2020 election uh, rolled around, due to combined efforts of federal uh, and state and local election officials, that number increased to around 95% of votes cast, including every one of those close call states. Importantly, Pennsylvania and Georgia both switched systems that had paper ballots associated with the vote. And you could count and recount and audit. In fact, Georgia uh, recounted or audited several times post November 3rd. And those systems that do that auditing were secure. Yeah, absolutely. You know, based on our work with the intelligence community, our understanding of... And what some state officials told you. And look, local officials. Absolutely. Look, I, I, you know, I, I continue to think that there are any number of state election officials that had every incentive in the world to prove that something happened to deliver an outcome to President Trump. So that respect, never happened. There are those on the Trump side of this ledger who think you might just be a Beltway insider, wise guy who came to a conclusion and tried to sell it to the president, and just because he didn't believe you, he had a right to do other things. How would you respond to well, that? Well, he certainly has the right to claim that he won or uh, you know, that it was stolen from him. But as we heard, when he takes that action towards the criminal conspiracy, that's a different matter. But again, our role at CISO was in support of state and local election officials and uh, ensuring that their voices were heard and that the work that they were doing got to the American people to instill and restore confidence in our public institutions. Were you interviewed by the special counsel? I was. Would you appear as a witness? Of course, of course. Do you regard this case as persecution of the former president, politically or otherwise? Well, it's certainly prosecution, but as for That's persecution... His, his word is persecution. Yeah, I, look, I, this is going to play out as it plays out. And uh, I, you know, it's a duly authorized investigation by the attorney general. Uh, you know, it's, it's, in, it's in the courts now. What are your concerns? I know you're on the outside now, but I know you keep in close contact with those who are monitoring 2024 about these underlying security and functionality issues. Well, uh, I think any time that you put technology systems into a process or into any sort of workflow, there's absolutely the possibility that there are vulnerabilities or misconfigurations that can take place. 
The key for election systems is you don't have single points of failure, what's known as software independence in this case, where a failure of the hardware or software doesn't result in an undermining of the entire process. And in the FBI, ANSYS continue to say that there's no known capability by an adversary that has been able to change or disrupt the casting, the counting, and the certification of a vote. I continue to have concerns, however, that uh, that we are not moving fast enough to, to get rid of some of these legacy systems and reducing vulnerabilities to stay ahead of what's an intelligent, continually improving adversary. Very quickly, Chris Krebs, how concerned are you about threats to those who work at the local level on election administration? Absolutely. The, you know, as we saw in 22, the, the threats uh, to election uh, administration officials is off the charts, and it's resulting actually in these officials retiring and leaving the workforce. So we're seeing a sort of voter suppression of another kind where there may not be enough opportunities to uh, administer the election process, which will cut down on opportunities for people to actually vote. Chris Krebs, thank you very much for coming in this morning. Thanks, Major. We appreciate it. We'll be right back. That does it for today. We thank you for watching. Margaret will be back next week for Face the Nation. I'm Major Garrett. And by the way, I'm not a fan of penalty kicks.